Okay, spiritual revival number three. Um, just a quick reminder, of course, you've all heard this enough now, but um, you're going to get the best, the most out of this series by reading and then also coming. And so <coughs> I won't be spending a whole lot of time in the chapter as we, you know, we're not going to be turning pages and reading out of it, but there is a lot of good information. This chapter was really good. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll be blessed or were blessed as you read it. The chapter is called, What is the Center of Our Problems? And I kind of changed it to the heart of the issue, really meaning the same thing, but um, more of a play on words because obviously our hearts and where our hearts are directed is really at the heart of the issue. It's a question that the author is asking to the Christian reader, right? So the answer isn't necessarily, even though Christians deal with open sin, the answer isn't open sin. Because that's usually the go-to, right? What's the center of everything, in the pro you know, in the problem, every problem in the universe? Sin. Well, yes, but sin is a consequence of something else, right? The devil, Lucifer, when he was a perfect angel, didn't just sin, right? There was something else before it became, before he started to sin, right? There, so sin is a consequence of something. So, to understand what's at the heart of the issue, I want to look at some examples here uh, in Scripture, and we're going to first start with the disciples. There's a big shift in the disciples, right? After the resurrection, do we see a very different group of disciples than before the death of Jesus? Very different group, right? All they did was lose one. Right? I mean, they went from 12 to 11, but their hearts are very different in these two moments. And so we're going to notice that as we study tonight. Let's start in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, and we'll start our reading at verse 33. Mark 9, 33. Would anyone like to read 33 through 35? Thank you there, Miss Norma. 33 through 35. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their feet, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. I don't know if that's ever happened to you with your kids or your grandkids. Our, our ears, even though we might be doing other things, our ears are listening. Um, today when we came home from the hike, I only had about 20 minutes from that moment to the next thing I needed to do and I wanted to lay down for those 20 minutes and I was on the bed with my eyes closed and almost across the house Titus and Liza um, are arguing with each other right and so I'm trying to rest but I can hear it even though they're not screaming they're not yelling I can hear them um, disputing amongst themselves right arguing with themselves Jesus was walking and they hear they were talking to each other as they walked right and then they get to the destination, and like I did it with the kids, when I called them, I said, what are you guys fighting about? Jesus said, so what was it that you guys were, were discussing back there, right? And of course, like my kids felt, the disciples, I'm sure, felt, oh no, did he hear us, <laughs> right? Oh no, was he listening to what we said? Did we say anything we shouldn't have said? And they start playing it, you know, in their minds, right? What, what in the world? But they kept, so that's why they kept silent, right? They kept silent because they knew they knew uh, that they probably shouldn't have been having this discussion, right? Because their walk wasn't supposed to be a walk of who's going to be the greatest. Were they seeing that in Jesus? Jesus was their leader. Were they seeing that in Jesus as their leader? Was he walking around, who's the greatest? No, right? Well, I guess he did in times, but he always said the Father, right? I do this because the Father has given me. He always gave the glory to, to God the way we're supposed to, right? Um, and Jesus was God, is God. He, is, he was God on earth at that time, right? But he was still saying, because of the Father, 
right? And Jesus wasn't here to walk around saying, I'm the greatest. He was here to serve and to be, obviously then, a servant, right? So you see their guilt in the fact that they're silent. This is what Jesus had to put up with for those years that he walked with his disciples. They're bickering amongst themselves because their heart was in it because they wanted to be the greatest. They expected Jesus to someday cast off the shackles, the iron shackles of Rome, right? At some point, Jesus was going to push off Rome and, and anoint himself as king. And we talked about this when we did our prophecy seminar because that's what people are, are, are looking for Jesus to do now. They're waiting for Jesus to come and have a millennial kingdom where he's king on this earth, right? But Jesus doesn't want to sit as king here. He wants to, he wants to end this world and build a new one and sit as king on that one, right? Yeah. Right? So they were waiting for him to cast off the iron shackles of Rome to set, establish himself as king. And if there's a king, then there's a right-handed man. And they all wanted to be that right-handed man, right? Their hearts weren't in the right place. They were following and they were learning. Um, but so Jesus knew this and he didn't cast them aside. This is wonderful truth, by the way. This is the gospel in this. We can look at human error and find the gospel. Do you know that? You could even look at your own error and find the gospel. You could look at my error and find the gospel. We can look at where man or you know humanity has fallen short and find the gospel. What's the gospel here? Who chose these 12 men to follow Jesus? Jesus did. He chose them even though their hearts weren't in the right place. So why do you think Jesus chose them then? Because he knew what they could become if they followed him. Yeah. And they were perfect because they are good examples for us. There's hope for us. Perfect, and I love that. They are good examples, and so we're kind of glad as we read that the Bible is honest with us, right? That we, I, I, and I've, I've pointed that out many times to others in other discussions. The Bible is honest. People make mistakes. Our God never does, but people make a lot of mistakes. And sometimes God has to react to those mistakes and take us down paths in this way and that way to try to get us back to the right path. But the Bible is honest. People, the church, we make mistakes. We're not infallible, right? So Jesus, and, and then of course Norma's right too, because Jesus saw what they could become. He didn't, he chose them not because of who they were, but because who they could be. Why has Jesus called us to serve him? Yeah. Same thing, right? Yeah. Because, because he not just sees who we are now, but what we can become if, and I like you put that condition in there, if we follow him. We had a visitor uh, speaker one time, and he said, uh, those that are safe to be saved will be safe. And I never forgot what I that was. Because God knows the heart, He knows the person. Yeah, He does know the heart. There won't be sin after. Uh, he knows those people will never sin. Right. Even though they'll still have the freedom. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, it, for eternity, the, 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 you know, there won't be temptation, but there will always be law. There will always be the ultimate rule of God is love. And we could challenge that and rebel against that. 10 trillion years from now, but no one ever will because it's not because it's been taken from us, the, the ability to freely choose, but because we will freely choose to follow him, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, again, you know, we're, we're building off of what we've learned. We learned and discussed many times that the 144,000 are those who follow the lamb where? Wherever. wherever he goes, right? Wherever he goes, we follow him. We fail after what we've gone through here. Right, right. And you know, and maybe you know this, but, but for anyone who doesn't, um, when Jesus was resurrected, he told Thomas to touch the scar in his side, right? So Jesus in his glorified body still had the scars. And so for eternity, the only evidence of sin anywhere in the universe will be the scars on his body. And every time we see Jesus, we'll remember that, you know, not that we'll need the reminder, but that's why we don't want to sin. Because look what it did to 
our God, our Creator, right? We don't want anything to do with that anymore. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So much sadness in this world today. So, that's the gospel. In humanity's failures and our failures, God can still use us. He understands who we are, but He plans for who we can become. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, um, oh, yeah, imagine then, if that's true, and that is true, he saw this in all 12, right? And amongst those 12 was a, a man named Judas Iscariot. Have you heard of him before? Did Jesus choose Judas for who he could become? Yeah. Did he want him to go down the road he took? No, he didn't want him to do that. But he did it. But Jesus... You know, I just had this conversation with a fellow pastor in town just yesterday sitting outside his church. Judas could have repented at any point, and imagine how strong his testimony could have been. Imagine how much work he could have done. I'm the guy who betrayed Jesus. I'm the one who sent him to the cross, and I'm the one who found repentance in that cross. Imagine how powerful that testimony could have been had he not, of course we know what he did, he went and hung himself instead. Right? Imagine though how much work Judas could have done, because Jesus chose him for what Judas could really truly become. So he saw something in Judas, right? So why did Judas kill himself? Because Judas was staring at Judas. And we're supposed to be staring at Jesus, right? Keep our eyes on Jesus. Because we follow the Lamb wherever I want Him to go. That's kind of how we live our lives some days, right? <laughs> I'm going to follow the Lamb as long as He goes left. <laughs> or as long as He goes right. We're going to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. He's in charge, right? And this fits in because the disciples should have taken their, their question. Were they having this, uh, this argument amongst themselves with Jesus? No. No? Because that's why He said, so what was it you were talking about? They were trying to keep this away from Him. And what should we do with our problems? Take, or our questions. If, if they had the question, Lord, who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom? They should have gone and asked them the question, right? Is it going to be me or me or him? Or, you know, uh, who's it going to be? Who's going to be right? They should have just gone rather than arguing amongst themselves, right? Which then brings us to our next verse because they don't, but someone else does finally just come straight to Jesus and ask him. Notice Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, and this will start really opening up our eyes to, to, the, to the issue here at hand. Matthew 20. Norma's read already. Anyone else want to read verse 20 and 21? Chapter 20, and Ray's going to read 20 and 21. Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to him with her son, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Interesting. It's kind of a question stated as a command, right? Sometimes we do that with God too. Lord, you should be doing this or this, or Lord, fix this right now, or Lord, do this or that, right? And really, he, we're not supposed to just go and command him and tell him what to do. That's what she's saying. Grant it, Lord, that these two, right? This is James and John, by the way. If you don't know who Zebedee's sons are, this is James and John. Um, this is the John that we're going to talk about here in a minute. We're going to write some things on the board about John. Um, but this is James and John, and she's saying, Lord, these two, they're the ones that are going to be the greatest in your kingdom, right? They're going to sit at your right hand and on your left hand, right? Um, now, let's notice, I'll read 22 and 23. Notice what Jesus says. He gives her some, some instructions. Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, 
you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those of, for whom it is prepared. By who? My Father is always. He, even Jesus, he, he's not even saying he's the greatest. He's saying my, my Father is going to make that decision. Right? My Father is going to figure that out. This is not my place. This is not what I'm doing here right now. This is not what this is all about. That's something that's heavenly. And so let heaven handle that. Well, they thought the kingdom was going to start then. And, and where is he pointing that? Yes, they're thinking the kingdom starting here and then. And where is he putting the attention? In heaven, right? Because the kingdom is there. Very good point. Okay. He says two things here. Drink my cup. And uh, be baptized with the baptism I've had. Okay. There's several different cups in the Bible. For example, there's God's wrath, right? The cup of God's wrath, which is separation from God. There's the cup of communion. Um, but neither of those fit this situation. Let's notice Psalms 23. Psalms 23. Anyone know what Psalms 23 is about? It's a famous psalm. Yep, the shepherd psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's notice what Jesus says in verse 5. How do we get something in the cup? I mean, obviously, if you're going to drink from a cup, there has to be something in the cup, right? Psalms 23, 5. If you're going to drink from a cup, there has to be something in the cup. So the cup's not the question. What's in the cup? Well, let's notice what... Uh, who wants to read Psalms 23, verse 5? Uh, I'll read it. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What's in the cup? Oil. Oil. Right? And what does oil represent? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. Jesus is saying, guys, you need the Holy Spirit. Okay? You got to drink the cup that I drank. Okay? Was Jesus full of the Holy Spirit? More so than we can understand, right? Full of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, what does it mean baptized um, by the baptism that I was baptized with. Now, we can assume, in fact, we know some of these guys were baptized by John the Baptist, so he's not talking about water baptism. Because obviously, if they're disciples and they're walking with him, they've been baptized. Okay? So, what is it? Let's look at um, Mark 1.8. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. And notice what John the Baptist says about baptism, or about the baptism of Christ. Anybody want to read Mark 1, 8 when we all get there? Oh, thank you, Mary Lou. That's fine. Mark 1, 8. I think Anne's almost there. I see it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 8. There you go. <laughs> go ahead, Mary Lou. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So what's the baptism that Jesus is going to baptize them with? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So in these two sim symbols, Jesus is saying the same thing. You guys need the Holy Spirit. Oh, and by the way, you guys need the Holy Spirit. There's two points to this. Number one, when Jesus repeats himself, what does that mean? Very important. And second of all, is there such a thing in Scripture as a double portion of the Holy Spirit? Yep. 
It's uh, in, uh, think about Elisha. Elisha asks Elijah for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and it's prophesied that he'll get a double portion of the Holy Spirit. He is saying, guys, you need a double portion of the Holy Spirit. So remember, we're asking, what's at the heart of the issue? Do we see an issue with the disciples? We want to be the greatest. We want to be the greatest. We want to be the greatest. And what is Jesus saying? You, need, you want to be the greatest? He's not saying you're not going to be the greatest. He's saying if you want to be the greatest, you need the Holy Spirit. A double portion of the Holy Spirit. Okay? They were self-centered. Jesus has their solution. The solution is you guys need the Holy Spirit. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 2. Just for a few moments here, we've got to speed up a little bit or we'll keep you here all night. Acts chapter 2. You know this story, I'm sure, the story of the day of Pentecost. And what, what was poured out upon the disciples at this time? The Holy Spirit, right? Anybody want to read Acts chapter 2, verse 1? Thank you, Miss Norma. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. And verse, um, so, oh, I'm sorry. Have they dropped the I'm better than you attitude here? What, how does it describe them in chapter 2, verse 1? They were all in one accord. All in one accord. And we're not talking about Honda Accords, right? They weren't sitting in a car. Purpose and pride. Ooh, I like that. King James with the win. Okay. Purpose of the same mind, you said? Purpose. Of one mind? Purpose of mind. Purpose of mind. They're sitting, so if they drop the I'm better than you attitude, uh -huh. they have. By the way, what's taking place between the two? So they were honored to be the greatest. I want to be the greatest. And now they're saying, nope, we're just going to sit and work together as one. What's happened in the middle that we skipped? Jesus has died and risen, right? They finally understood His purpose. And when we understand Christ's purpose, guess what? We also then understand our purpose. Is that cool to think about? We keep our eyes upon what Jesus is, was here to do and is doing for us. We'll understand our purpose as well, right? Okay, so they've dropped the I'm better than you attitude. And what finally is the result in verse 4? Miss Norma, would you read verse 4? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Beautiful. Is this the first moment the disciples ever had the Holy Spirit? Tough question. Think about that. This, they had not had any of the Holy Spirit. Who, who has led them to conviction earlier? Who led them to baptism? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. Who led them to follow Christ? The Holy Spirit. Who brought them to that room by one accord? The Holy Spirit. So they have the Holy Spirit, but now they receive the double portion of the Holy Spirit, right? Now they've received the second wind, that, you know, that, that adrenaline, that spiritual adrenaline, that second wind they've received. Now they have drank his cup and now they've been baptized with his baptism. They now have the double portion of the Holy Spirit. Working together as one mind. Where was their mind? On the purpose of Christ. When they kept their minds on the purpose of Christ, they understood their purpose. And when they understood their purpose and accepted their purpose, their mission, Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit. Okay, now let's open it up bigger picture now. Now let's just say the whole Christian church. Has the Christian church received the Holy Spirit? Well, in history, we all... This is, this is our history here, the day of Pentecost, right? So this is the former reign. Now is there going to be a double portion of the Spirit again at the end time, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain that we've talked about in church, right? How do we get that? Oh, by asking, as we talked about last week, constantly asking, but also by keeping our eyes on Christ's mission so we can better understand our mission and working together as one. It's interesting to me that as we've been, you know, as Adventists are getting closer to 
2020 and, and the next general conference session and you know with the ideas of women's ordination and this and that and the whole bit and you know we see a, a struggle going on in our church but what's interesting is that as I've talked to a couple of other pastors in town they've mentioned that their denominations are also heading to civil wars that there's issues over this and that and I won't say who because we were talking in confidence but a couple of others are saying yeah our, our, our denomination not their church local church but their denomination yeah we're probably going to go through another split here soon the churches are all looking at these, we're going to go through a split, and it's the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. Why do they do that? Just because the, the attitude, who's the greatest, who's the authority, who's the power, right? I'm, I'm the boss kind of thing, right? Um, and, and we're supposed to be the opposite. Our hearts are supposed to be working together, unitedly, trying to spread the gospel and finish the work. Also, the want to follow the world and what's popular. Yeah. yeah. But that's Satan's work. That is Satan's work. The Dividing. Each other. Yeah. Why do we have hundreds of denominations? Yeah. Satan's work, right? Yeah. Now, that's not to say that we, that we shouldn't be a part of God's church, right? Because they were all united here. Were these, were these disciples here in Acts chapter 2, were they, were they organized? Trying to be. <laughs> they were organized. They were in a pur one purpose of mind, right? They were in one accord. They were like-minded. They came together, and what did they do? They prayed. And they said, okay, Lord, come at us. Give us that double portion of the Spirit, right? So they, they were organized. They were together, but they were together of one mind, right? Okay, go ahead. Looking above real quick, so they had chosen another disciple. So they said they asked to be guided in this, but then they cast lots. Is that like heads or tails? Uh, technically, the, the, we're not totally sure what that meant. Okay. Um, it was probably more spiritual than just flipping a coin. Yeah. But that's definitely how it sounds to us. Like they just flipped a coin. Um, but, but, but it was definitely a spiritual matter of praying and praying and praying. In the Old Testament, it was the umum and thumum, right? It was the, 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 the high priest had these jewels on his vest. And they, um, sometimes when they just couldn't figure it out, it was um, God spoke, well, used those things to, to, to reflect his will for them oh, on what decision so to make. Was, uh, they asked for God to guide the yeah. outcome. The outcome of whatever the lots were. Even if it was a flipping of a coin, which I don't think it was. Yeah. It was, okay. Lord, let yeah. it be tails, you know, let it be heads or tails if, if you want it to be heads or tails, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they say, if you make a decision by flipping a coin, your reaction to the outcome tells how you really feel. Yeah. And it's funny. Yeah. I actually have seen that. I've seen it in TV shows also, but I've actually seen it in person as well. A pastor did that once to someone that we were talking to. We were both talking to someone. And he, he I forget, it was, he gave him like, this is what you need to do. And then the person was like, oh, but I want to do that. Okay, then that's, that's, where you're, that's where God's leading you. Right? You're coming to me and asking me, does God want me to do this or this? I've been praying and I don't hear him. Well, you need to go do this. But I really want that. Okay, well, then that's how God's leading you. That's the way God's leading you. Right? If you know already, you're just looking for someone to tell you. God's already led you to do that. Right? Yeah. Okay. One more uh, quick thing I want to show you here. and We're already almost out of time. Mark chapter 3. A couple of verses in order to show this to you. I want to show you um, more specifically here. Now we looked at the, at the disciples as a collective. Now let's look at one particular um, disciple. Let's, let's look at John, Mark chapter 3. And who would like to read verse 17? I know, I, and by the way, I think some of you were here a year, year and a half ago, and I talked about this, so this might be a review for some of you. Um, but Mark three seventeen. anybody want to read that? He says, um, James and Zebedee and his brother John, to, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Yeah, sons of thunder. Who what? Gave them that name? Uh, Jesus? Yeah. Oh. 
Why, why do you think they get the, what does that sound like, Sons of Thunder? Does that sound like they're nice, peaceful, laid back, chilling guys? No. <laughs> they had the spirit of rebellion, right? An angry spirit. Again, Je- who chose them? Jesus chose them. Jesus was choosing them, knowing what they could become if they follow him, not because of who they were. Sometimes we feel unworthy. Sometimes we feel like we're not good enough, right? Jesus works how we're going to be or what we can be, right? Okay, sons of thunder. So John was a son of thunder. I have, uh, I have no way of knowing this or proving this. I'll just share what, what a Greek scholar once said. Though, I don't really think it, it can't be true because Jesus is the one who named them this. But anyway, I'll share what he once said. That in the Greek, sons of thunder... Is, is actually um, an insult, that it's actually rude. It's, uh, it's, it's close to swearing. So in other words, Jesus was pretty... Now, we could at least learn that lesson, that Jesus was, wasn't meaning this in, in, in... Well, he loved them, but he was kind of keeping in their mind who they were. Right? He was trying to point out to them, you guys have a problem with anger. Right? So it wasn't a cute, cuddly nickname he gave them. He was trying to poke at them a little bit and say, guys... Okay, so son of thunder. Now, that's John the beloved. That's John the disciple. By the way, this is the exact same John who receives the revelation. Let's notice what Revelation calls him. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. So we're going to look at the beginning. He's the son of thunder. Then we're going to look at the end, what the Bible calls him at the end. And then we're going to see the name he's called in the middle to kind of tie it all together. Who would like to read verse 1? Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Anybody? Thank you, Ray. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent the signified, and signified it by his angel to the servant John. What's John called? Servant. Yes, that's half of it. Revelator. Who's whose servant? His servant? Yeah, don't let the small pronouns skip our minds, because that's how our that's how our, that's our human nature and that's our American culture there, right? We skip over the small words sometimes. He's not just a servant, he's his servant, right? Oh, that's cool. He can, he went from a son of thunder to being his servant. Is that a big, major change? And by the way, who, who wrote the Revelation? I mean, he writes it in pen, but who, who inspired John to write Revelation? Christ. Yeah, the Father to the Son to the Spirit, right? We even had some of those steps in the verse. The Father to the Son to the Spirit to, to the angel, the angel to the prophet, right? And so it came from Christ. Christ, is, Christ named him the Son of Thunder, and Christ named him his servant. These are titles coming from Christ himself, right? And this shows a major change from the guy who's got a temper, from the guy who's rebellious, from the guy who doesn't shut up, to the guy who listens and follows the Lamb wherever he goes. Cool? Now, there's a third nickname, and it's given in the middle, and this is going to show us how John changed. John 13, 23. We've got two more verses to read. John 13, 23. John 13 and verse 23. Not one John, but John. Yep, the Gospel of John. John chapter 13 and then verse 23. By the way, who writes this gospel? John. This is the same John. And the, he, he, you know, John never reports that he's ever called the son of thunder. That's not in the book of John. We're, we read that in the book of Mark, right? He calls himself the beloved. <laughs> yes. He doesn't call himself the son of thunder because he doesn't want to admit maybe where he's come from. Right? Mark, who's, who, now Mark wasn't a disciple, but he learns the stories from Peter. Okay, so Peter's the one who points out, 
hey, John, this guy who's now the beloved, this guy who's doing really great work, he was once called the son of thunder, right? Because that's how brothers pick on each other, right? They, they tell you the truth. <laughs> but notice what John calls himself. And he did not mean this egotistically. This is what changed him. This is what was important to him. Um, verse th 23, chapter 13, verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And he uses that phrase to talk about himself several times in the book of John. The one whom Jesus loved. He calls himself that. Yeah. Do any of the other disciples refer to him in that way? No. Uh-uh. No, they don't. And again, I don't believe, there's no reason to believe that this was meant egotistical. He never says the one Jesus loves most, the one that Jesus loves more than the others. He never calls another disciple the one that Jesus, eh, kind of liked. <laughs> I don't believe this is egotistical. This is not, that's right, I'm the one Jesus loved. Jesus loved all of us. Oh, yeah. Jesus loves, oh, by the way, John is also the one who says in John 3, 16, for God so loved, loved the world. So, yeah, John accepts that Jesus loves everybody, right? So this is not egotistical. This is what changed him. From the son of thunder to the servant, what changed him? Love. The love of Jesus. The one whom Jesus loved. When we focus on the mission of Christ, our mission changes. We're willing to follow the Lamb wherever He goes if we remember Jesus loves us. Jesus has a purpose. Jesus has a plan. Jesus is working in our lives. We keep our eyes on Jesus. Last verse, sorry, last verse. Um, Psalms 51. One more. I, we've got to cover this one. This is really, this is going to tie it all together. We have got, so what's at the heart of the issue? We don't focus on the love of Jesus enough. We've got to focus on the love of Jesus. And when you get to Psalms 51, I'll give you one quick example, and then we'll read from Psalms 51. We're going to read verse 10 in a moment of Psalms 51. By the way, this is uh, a quick side note, just so you understand the context. Psalms 51 is what David wrote after he slept with Bathsheba, who was, another, who was married to another man, right? And this is his repentance prayer. But, One quick example of how we need to make our decisions based on what God wants for us and how God loves us and how God treats us. When um, Potiphar's wife threw herself sexually at Joseph and said, you can have me in any way you want, how did Joseph reply? Yeah, he said, yeah, exactly. How can I do this wickedness and sin against my God. His eyes, his focus was not on her body, which you can imagine. Who cares how she looked? You can imagine how she was dressed and what she was offering. If his eyes had been on that, he would have been like David in the story of David and Bathsheba, I bet, right? Because where was David's eyes in this story that we're about to read his repentance prayer? He was walking on the rooftop in the middle of the night when kings were supposed to be out to battle. That's what the story says. And that's a really important part. David was supposed to be in battle. He wasn't supposed to be in Jerusalem. And when we're slacking, when we're not doing our mission, when we're not doing our purpose, Satan can weasel his way in there, right? He sent her husband to battle. He sent her husband to battle several times, right? Eventually having to send him to the front of the line to kill him because he, he had impregnated Bathsheba, right? What a wicked, awful story. And why? Because... He was not doing the purpose and mission of Christ. And he had his eyes on, it says that he saw her beauty and he desired her. That's what the story says. He had his eyes on her rather than his, you know, I heard Doug Basher say this years ago and it helped me. I was a young man. I'm not a young man anymore. And I was a young man back then. And Doug Basher said something that blew me away and has changed my life. Not that I'm perfect, but he's really helped me. 
He said, uh, you know, someone asked him, you know, it's, it, with the way clothing styles are and things, it's really hard these days not to put your eyes on, on a lady. How, how, can, how have you trained your eyes as a pastor to not look at, at what they're flaunting? And he said, when I see a beautiful woman, he says, number one, I turn my eyes and I look at another guy and I see them looking at her. And I see how stupid they look when they look at her with their tongue hanging out and they're like, wow, right? So he turned, so what, but really his point is, and he explained this, his, really, his point is, I turn my eyes away. I look away. And then he says, I pray for her salvation. He says, I'm not judging her. I have no idea. Maybe she loves God. I have no idea. But I just pray that God blesses her that day. And when you're praying, and, I, and I've used this at Holbrook when I counseled young men when they'd come to me and say, you know, I'm struggling with pornography. I say, when you're in that moment, number one, turn it off. And then pray for the people you just saw and pray for their heart. Don't judge them. Don't say, Lord, they're obviously wicked. Going out. Just say, Lord, I don't know who they are and what they're doing, but I hope you can bless them today and let them turn their heart to you. When you're praying about that person, and oh, by the way, you can apply this to any sin. You can apply this to, you know, and going back to the question, how can I, if, you, if you're mad at that person, pray, Lord, bless them today and turn their heart to you. Right? All of us can, if you're really mad at someone, bothered by someone, or tempted by someone, pray for them and then you're less likely to go down that road of hating them, angry at them, sinning with them, whatever, right? That's something for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that, that was a long-winded uh, side note, right? We went way off track there. But um, Joseph kept his eyes on God, and he didn't sin with Potiphar's wife. David kept his eyes on Bathsheba and he sinned with Bathsheba, right? And killed, her husband. and killed her husband. It followed up by several sins, right? Sin of coveting, the sin of jealousy, the sin of lots of things, right? Yeah. Okay, you know, now. Did, did you remember reading that David made Uriah drunk? Yeah. Made what? Uriah drunk. Yeah, he tried everything to get I, this guy to... Yeah. But what he was trying to do was he wanted Uriah to go sleep because there were no DNA tests back then. There was no Maury Povich talk shows where you could go on and say, you are not the father. Oh, he, tried he tried to get Uriah to go home and sleep with his wife so when the baby was born, oh, right? Oh, right? When the baby's born, oh, well, hey, congratulations, you had a baby. And of course, David would know whose baby it really was. That's terrible. That is terrible. And you know, he, he made him dumb, but we're... God was telling uh, uh, Aaron uh, that the Levites and, and to not to drink wine or oh, yeah. drink forever. Yeah. And I, I thought, did David uh, drink, I mean, habitually? Of, of a At least in that story. At least in that story, right? Yeah. Because he was so desperate to cover his sin. Rather than turning his heart to Jesus, he was desperate to cover his own sin. And does it ever work for any of us? No. no. When Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves in leaves. And yet when Jesus says to them, what do they say? I was, we were naked and afraid. Did the leaves cover them up? No, they still felt naked, right? It never works. Never works. Okay. Now, why are we talking about all this? Psalm 51. We've got to wrap up. Psalms 51 verse 10. When David finally repents... When he finally gets things right with his heart with God. Notice this beautiful, repentant prayer he writes down for us. I'll read this. He says in Psalms 51 verse 10. And this is a beautiful song too. I don't have a gift of music or the gift of singing, but uh, maybe you can YouTube it. This is a beautiful song. Someone turn this into music. Yeah, it's beautiful. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now, here's what I want you to know. This is where we, we were coming all along. That word steadfast spirit is the Hebrew word kun, and it means a ready spirit. Renew in me a ready spirit. That, that means something different to me than steadfast. 
Steadfast means I'm staunch against something, right? And that, that's powerful too. But I like this idea of a ready spirit. What does that mean? A ready spirit. Lord, the devil's going to attack again. Help me be ready. Keep my eyes on you. And every before I'm tempted, because he knows he's weak. He knows if he goes back out on that roof and he looks over across the street again and sees Bathsheba, he's going to desire. He's saying, Lord, keep me away from that. Make me ready. Right? Make me ready to stand against temptation. This is what we're supposed to be praying for as we pray for the Holy Spirit. Lord, keep me ready for the fight. Keep me focused on your mission. Keep me focused on your love. So that when these other things happen, I don't care and I don't walk after and I don't do it because I'm walking with the Lamb wherever He goes. Right? Keep me ready. Keep me ready. Okay, let's pray. we got to get out of here. Father, thank you for your great love, your patience, your care. I ask, Lord, that you will renew in each of us a ready spirit, one that is ready to fight, one that is ready to cast off temptation and doubt and hurt and pain, one that is steadfast and strong, though, Lord, but is prepared for whatever we face. So that whatever the world offers, whatever the devil offers us, Lord, we will only simply follow you wherever you lead. In Jesus' name, amen.